continue to uh, pick up where we left off last um, uh, Sunday evening uh, in the Sunday evening uh, uh, service. So uh, we want to pick it up. And what we were uh, dealing with as we concluded the service on Wednesday evening was uh, uh, demonic work in the life of a child of God, in the life of a saved um, uh, person. Now, we begin uh, with uh, the first resurrection appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, and of course that was to uh, Mary Magdalene. And uh, twice in the Bible, the Bible says, out of whom were cast seven demons. Now that's mentioned twice uh, in the Word of God. Now of course that was before uh, she got saved, and uh, so I'm sure she had a very uh, dramatic uh, conversion in, uh, as we study uh, the Word of God. But now what we want to look at tonight are several verses before we go to the Lord in prayer about the work of the devil, uh, Satan, in the life of the child of God. Now, we might refer to it as demonic work in the life of the child of God. Now, see, uh, there are scores of verses about Uh, Satan and the devil and uh, demonic work in the epistles that are written uh, to God's children. Now, in other words, these are not verses for the unsaved, but in relation uh, to the saved. Now, uh, turn in your Bible to uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. Now, uh, first of all, here in chapter 2, and verse 11 of 2 Corinthians, it says, lest Satan should get an advantage, the Bible says, of us. See, now that verse is not talking about the unsaved, but it's talking about those that are saved. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. See, and... Uh, Now, he's talking here about God's children. We don't want the devil, we don't want Satan to get an advantage of us in our lives as God's children. Now, he says, for we are not ignorant of his devices, or at least as a child of God, we should not be ignorant of his devices, how the devil uh, works in the life of a child of God. So that's one of many, many verses in the Bible about the work of Satan in the life of a child uh, of God. And then as we um, turn over a few books to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27. Now in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27, it says, neither give place to the devil. Now obviously what that's talking about is that we should not allow the devil to get a foothold in our lives as God's children. Now, see what it says there in Ephesians 4 and verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. In other words, don't allow the devil to get a foothold in your life as a child of God. Now, what he's talking about in the context there are two things. Number one, previously he's talking about being angry and uh, uh, letting uh, anger control your life. When somebody uh, becomes angry, they're out of control, and obviously the devil, that's how the devil gets a foothold in their life. And then uh, um, in the next verse, verse 28, he's talking about stealing. And uh, evidently a lot of these people before they got saved, they were involved in stealing. And so uh, what he's saying that obviously as a Christian, uh, you shouldn't steal. And the thought there in the Word of God is that um, don't let the devil get a foothold in your life. Don't give him a base of operations in your uh, your life as a child uh, of God. Now, um, uh, the famous verse, uh, James chapter 4 and verse 7. Now, here uh, 
again, is another verse in the Bible, and all of these verses have to do with the work of the devil in the life of the child of God. Now, in James chapter 4 and verse 7, the Bible says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Now, now that's the positive thing there in the Word of God. Uh, very obviously, um, what that's teaching uh, is that we ought to submit to God, we ought to obey God, we ought to be in obedience to God. But now, in James chapter 4 and verse 7, we have that famous verse in the Bible, say, resist the devil. Now, who, who's he talking to there? Again, he's talking to God's children. He's not talking to the unsaved, but he's talking there to those that are saved. So he said, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. James 4 and verse 7, say, resist the devil. Now, that word resist comes from two words, and uh, one is against, and the other is to stand. Say, to uh, stand against the devil in your life. Say, that's a very positive thing that you and I as God's children are to stand against the devil. We are to resist the work of the devil in our lives as God's children. Now, if you look back in um, chapter 4 and uh, uh, verse 6, you have that same word. See, speaking of uh, God, uh, but he giveth more grace, James 4 and verse 6, he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God, see, resisteth the proud. See, God is against pride. God takes his stand against a proud person. So the Bible says God resisteth the proud. He giveth grace unto uh, uh, the humble. Now, uh, in James chapter 4 and verse 7, say, resist the devil. Now, uh, that sp uh, speaks of an ongoing activity in the life of all of us tonight and every child of God. We need to uh, resist the devil. Why? Because the devil will be active in the life of every uh, child of God. So now he says, resist the devil. Now, of course, the great Bible illustration of this, and I'm sure we're all familiar with that, is when the de devil attacked Jesus in the temptation, Matthew chapter 4, and we find how that Jesus resisted the devil, and uh, that familiar passage in the Word of God uh, says that he quoted the Bible three times. Say, he resisted Satan on the basis of the Word of God. And that's how Satan is resisted in our lives, uh, is on the basis of the Word of God. See, we must submit to God. We must obey the Bible. Now, if we don't obey the Bible, if the Bible is not real and alive in our lives, then we'll never be able to resist the devil. Jesus quoted the Bible three times in resisting uh, uh, the devil. But now, you see, James 4 and verse 7 is a great verse of victory because it says here, resist the devil, and then what will the devil do according to James 4 and verse 7. See, he'll flee from you. See, he'll run away from you, just like in relation to the Lord Jesus. When Jesus was tempted of the devil, he resisted the devil on the basis of the Word of God, and then the Bible says the devil left him. Now, see, this is a great verse in the Bible. See, we need to be resisting the devil. We need to be resisting the work of the devil in our lives as uh, uh, God's children. But um, that's something that will definitely happen. Now, it doesn't mean that the devil will not come back, but it means that if we use the Word of God and we resist the devil, we can have victory over his work in our lives. And not only that, but he will leave us if we resist him. Now, now uh, if we fool around with it, if we compromise with something, uh, we give place to the devil, we give him a base of operation in our lives, then um, 
You see, he's not going to flee from us. He'll have us just where he uh, wants us uh, to be. Now, uh, the other uh, very familiar verse in relation to the child of God and the devil is found in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. And here uh, the Bible says, uh, number one, be sober. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. 1 Peter 5, 8. Uh, we have two commands here in the Word of God. See, number one is be uh, sober. Now, and then the next command is be vigilant. Now, and then the reason is given here why you and I ought to be sober and we ought to be uh, vigilant as God's uh, 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 children. And that is because, now this is the reason, because, see, your adversary. Now, see, now this has nothing to do with the unsaved. This is Peter writing to those that are saved. See, you and I have an enemy in our lives, in our walk with the Lord. Now, that enemy, uh, as we read about it here, your adversary, see, the devil. See, the devil is our adversary, our enemy, as a child of God. See, we are in spiritual warfare. We are all in a spiritual uh, battle. Now, he says, as a roaring lion. Now, uh, the roaring lion there uh, is very, very graphic because it means uh, a lion that is hungry. And he's roaring because he's hungry and he's after prey. Now, see, and that is the way the devil is depicted in the Bible in relation to the child of God. See, he's out to destroy the child of God. Um, he's hungry. He is after us. Now, and the Bible says, seeking whom he may devour. So now the devil wants to mess up every child of God. That's very clear according to the verse uh, here. Then he goes on in verse 9, and he says, whom resist. Now you have another strong word here. You have a third word here, and that's the word steadfast. You must resist him uh, uh, steadfastly, or steadfast. Resist, how? Steadfast in the faith. Now, the faith speaks of the Word of God. So he's not talking about uh, faith as uh, uh a principle in the life of the child of God. But when you read that in the Bible, when it says, uh, in, say, the faith. See, now what that is talking about as we study the Word of God is uh, very uh, simply that uh, the body of truth, the teaching, the doctrine of the Word of God that was revealed to these people here um, very uh, uh, clearly uh, in the Word of God. So uh, it's the Bible, say, uh, the teaching that they have received, which was from the apostles and would be the equivalent of the Word of God, the very words of God in that New Testament. Now, you see, um, when we think about that, uh, you see, that is how we resist the devil, as the Bible uh, says here. Be steadfast, say, in the faith, say, in the teaching of the Word of God, in teaching uh, in relation to the revealed truth of uh, God uh, Almighty. Now, you look back in verse 8, see the word sober. Now, he's saying that if we're going to have victory over the devil, number one, as God's children, we need to be sober. Now, um, that's the word, interesting word in the Bible, because actually simply what it means is the absence of drinking alcoholic beverages. And what it's talking about is uh, be sober in the sense, do not be uh, drunk. Don't be like a drunk person. Now, a drunk person, they say things they shouldn't say. They have no control over themselves. They drive cars and uh, get in accidents and um, on and on it uh, goes. But now, see, he says, you as God's children need to be uh, sober. Now, not drunk. Say, don't get drunk 
with alcoholic beverages. Now, of course, it's used uh, figuratively in the Word of God. And what it's talking about, see, is you and I need to be sober in what sense? See, you and I need to be sober in the sense that we ought to live a disciplined life. See, if a child of God does not live a disciplined life, uh, you see, they'll never have victory in their life over the work of the devil uh, in their life. Now, uh, again, see, uh, the opposite of a drunk person. See, uh, the drunk man, uh, he has no control over himself. The drunk man has no discipline uh, and, and so forth. See, now what he's talking about here is that we need to be sober. Um, we need to be disciplined in our lives as the child of God. Now, the next word that he uses here is the word uh, vigilant. Now, that's an interesting uh, word in uh, the Bible, and it refers to the matter of being spiritually alert. See, being vigilant in that sense, do not go to sleep as a Christian. Because if you go to sleep as a Christian, the devil will get in there and mess you up and get you out of the will uh, of God. In other words, have your eyes, your spiritual eyes, wide open. Uh, be alert. Now, that's a word that's used many, many times in our Bibles, and it's translated watch. See, the Bible says, watch and pray. Did you ever think about that? Well, what does it mean to watch and pray? See, and that's a word that refers to being spiritually alert. See, be on guard. Be alert. Do not go to sleep spiritually, but uh, be on guard. Why? Because, see, the devil is seeking to mess you up as a Christian. The devil doesn't want you to serve God. The devil doesn't want you uh, to do uh, uh, the will uh, of God. Now, for instance, turn to Matthew chapter um, 26, and here's how that same word is used in the Bible. Now, in Matthew chapter uh, 26, and we read here, uh, for instance, in verse uh, uh, 38, and um, Matthew chapter uh, 26, and uh, look at... Uh, Verse 40, and uh, well, look uh, back at verse 38. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Uh, tarry ye here, and he says here, watch with me. Now, now this is Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. This is a, a holy of holies place in the word of God, Gethsemane. Now, and what he says here, and watch with me. Now you see, that is that word, same word, be vigilant. See, that's what he's saying. When he says, watch and pray. You see, uh, be spiritually uh, awake. Have your eyes wide open. Now, this is not a time to go to sleep. It's not a time to fool around, mess around. Why? See, this is the eve of his arrest. They are going to come and arrest the Lord Jesus uh, uh, Christ. Now, see, but what is uh, exhortation here? He's saying here, watch with me. Now, that word watch means simply, uh, basically, to have your eyes wide open. Be spiritually alert. And if there's ever a time when they should have been spiritually alert, it was this time, amen? I mean, here Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, that great prayer, and then the enemies are on their way to arrest him. Now, look down in verse 40. Now, in verse 40, and he came unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, they're sleeping, and saith unto Peter, what could ye not, and you have that word again, see the word vigilant, say it's that same word, vigilant, say be on guard. Be spiritually alert. Say, this was the time when our Lord needed his disciples to be people of prayer and to be praying for him. If there is ever a time in his ministry when he needed the, fe the prayer fellowship of Peter, James, and John, it was now in the Word of God 
and he told them now, be on guard, be spiritually. Have your eyes wide open. This, this is not a time uh, to sleep. This is a time to pray and uh, seek God's face at this time. Then uh, you look down in verse 41, and he says, watch and pray. Now, you see, again, you have that word, and that's the word translated vigilant. Say it means to be wide awake, to be spiritually alert. See, and that's what they uh, were not spiritually alert, obviously, and they, they were sleeping. And as a result, and I believe in the Garden of Gethsemane, there's where you have Jesus' victory. Jesus won the victory in his time of prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that, that's, uh, he won that victory uh, nevertheless, uh, not my will, but thy will be done. But in that same garden of Gethsemane, that's where the disciples lost their victory. And the reason why they lost their victory, and they're all going to forsake him, and Peter is going uh, to deny him three times. See, three times here Jesus told them, uh, be vigilant, be wide open, have your eyes wide open. Uh, open. Be spiritually uh, alert. Don't, this is not a time to go to sleep. And they did go to sleep, and they didn't pray. They were not vigilant. Uh, they did not have their spiritual eyes wide open, and as a result, they all uh, forsook the Lord. But as you read there in verse 41, watch and pray. See, that's the word, be spiritually alert. Now, in the epistles, uh, there in Colossians, Paul, Paul says to the believers, say, watch and pray. Now, again, what does that mean, watch? Well, say, that's the word vigilant. That's a word that means be spiritually alert. Because if you are not spiritually alert, you will not be a person of prayer. You will not uh, pray. Now, in that famous verse in verse 41 of uh, Matthew 26, say, watch, be spiritually alert, and pray. Now, if you are spiritually alert, you will be a person of prayer. Now, now someone who does not pray, and uh, they're not given to prayer, they just uh, say, rush out on the day and, and tackle the day in their own strength and in their own uh, uh, power. Now, say, somebody does that, say, they'll not have any strength against the devil's attack in their life. Now, as he says here in verse 41, say, watch and pray. And what's the purpose of watching and praying? What is the purpose of being spiritually alert with your eyes wide open and praying that ye enter not into temptation? See, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, we need to be spiritually alert and people of prayer because that's how we get power in our lives as uh, God's children. So, see, um, as you go back to 1 uh, Peter chapter 5 and uh, verse 9, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 9, and what we find here, again, you say, be sober. Now, be vigilant. That's the word watch. That's what Jesus said about prayer. He said, uh, be spiritually alert. See, and they were not and they sinned, and they all lost the victory, and they all got out of the will of God. See, Paul, in his epistles, tell, uh, exhorts us, say, watch and pray. Be spiritually alert. See, and if you are spiritually alert, you will be a person of prayer. Now, if you're not on guard, spiritually alert, you will not be a person of prayer. Now, see, in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Do we need to be disciplined, sober? Why do we need to be disciplined? And why do we need to be spiritually alert? And he gives a reason in the verse. He says in verse 8, because. See, now here's the reason why you and I ought to be spiritually alert. Have our eyes wide open spiritually. See, um, he says, be sober, be vigilant, uh, be vigilant, because, see, you're, you have an enemy. See, you and I 
as Christians have an enemy. And the Bible says, your adversary, the devil. See, as a roaring lion goeth about seeking whom he may devour. We'll say a, a note about that as we went, uh, go on. Say how he wants to devour you as a child of God. How he wants to devour me as a child of God of God. Say, get us out of the will of God so that our lives don't count for the Lord, that we are no testimony whatsoever uh, for the Lord. But then he says here, see, whom resist, he says, uh, steadfast. Now that's the word solid, firm. Uh, sometimes it's associated with a solid foundation. Now, see what he's saying uh, there in verse 9. You resist uh, the devil in a solid way, in a strong way. Because if you don't uh, resist him in a solid and strong way, in a firm way, that devil is going to have victory in your life. Now, again, see, all of this has no application to the unsaved. Peter's not talking here about uh, the unsaved, but he's talking here about uh, the saved God's uh, children. And so as you, you see, resist steadfast in the faith. See, that's the body of Christian truth. See, you resist the devil on the basis of the Word of God. See, the faith. It's not talking about just having faith, see, as a, as a characteristic or a, a, that type of a thing. But see, it's talking about the faith. See, so remember what Jude says, uh, how we are to earnestly contend. You remember what Jude says, for the faith. See, so he's not talking about faith there, uh, just faith, but he's talking about the faith. In other words, say that body of truth that was delivered to the children of God, which would be obviously the equivalent of uh, the word uh, uh, of God. So um, that's very clear as we study the scripture here, that we uh, whom resist steadfast in uh, the faith. And then he says, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now, someone says, well, um, I'm under the attack of the devil. Uh, I must be out of the will of God, or maybe I'm not living right. See, what does Paul say? He's saying every child of God is under the attack of the devil. Every, the devil goeth about in the life of every child of God to neutralize that person so that person's life will not count for the Lord. See what he says, knowing the same afflictions are, are, are accomplished uh, in your brethren that are in the world. Say, don't think you're the only one going through uh, demonic work in your life or the attacks of the devil in your life. He's saying every child of God experiences that. So that's why we have these three words, and they're three words that we need to circle and write in the fly uh, leaf of your uh, Bible. See, one is that word resist. See, uh, James 4 and verse 7, resist the devil, stand against the devil. See, and that second word we have here in these passages in 1 Peter uh, 8 is that word be sober, be a disciplined person. Do not be like the drunkard. See, and that's the uh, picture of the word here. Say, don't drink alcoholic beverages and, uh, to where you can't think straight and you can't walk straight and you do things that you'd never uh, ever do if you were a sober, disciplined person. So now number two, he says you need to be uh, sober, and then in uh, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, we have that word vigilant. You see, keep your spiritual eyes wide open. Discern things. Have spiritual discernment. Have spiritual eyes, so, uh, so to speak. Uh, so that your spiritual eyes are wide open. Now, that's what he's talking about in relation to God's children. Because if we're like those disciples, you see, in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus said, 
you ought to be vigilant at this time. Jesus said, if there's ever a time you ought to pray, it is now, and they went to sleep. See, that word watch there, used three times, is that same word as vigilant. See, keep your spiritual eyes wide open. You see, seek the will of God and make sure that uh, you're uh, under uh, His control. Now, as we study the New Testament and the epistles, one of the interesting things that we study is that how does he go about as a roaring lion in the life of a child of God? See, and uh, it's very interesting as you study the Word of God along that line. And you see how the devil attacks certain people as we read and we study the Word of God. Now, the first thing that comes to our mind, if the devil goes around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, that means he wants me to be an alcoholic. He wants me to go out and get drunk. He wants me to uh, uh, be a dope addict. Or uh, he wants me to uh, commit some terrible, immoral sin. Now, that is not primarily... Now, the devil would be glad to do all those things in a person's life, but that's not primarily what we read about in the New Testament in relation to how the devil attacks a person. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul said that the devil and his demons is an angel of, and what's the next word? Light, not darkness. Say an angel of light. And then it says over there that his ministers are ministers of righteousness. Well, let's turn to it because I'm sure it's very uh, uh, informative and edifying as we uh, turn over there to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter um, 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's turn over there in uh, uh, the word, word of God. Now, um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11... And verse 13, he says, For such are false apostles. Now, the people that he's addressing there in the context are people that were saying those false apostles are more authoritative than the apostle Paul. Imagine that. And they were siding with false pop, uh, apostles rather than the Apostle Paul. See, so he says, uh, now such are these people that have come to you, and they say, don't listen to the Apostle Paul. We are superior over the Apostle Paul. We have uh, more truth than Paul had, and that had to do with uh, circumcision, work, salvation. But then he says in verse 13, they are deceitful workers. See, they're out to deceive you and transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. They are great imitators. And if someone doesn't have spiritual insight based on the Word of God, they're really going to get messed up uh, spiritually. Now, what's he saying in the next verse? In verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 11, And no marvel... He said, don't be surprised. You should not be surprised. For Satan himself is translated, uh, transformed into an angel of light. Not darkness, but an angel of light. He wants a Christian to be moral. He wants a Christian to live a good life. But the bottom line is, you see, so they never serve God, never do the will of God, never uh, uh, really have a life that counts for the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the main job of the devil in my life and in your life is to neutralize you and me as God's children so that our lives do not count for the kingdom of God and the local church on this earth. Now, he says... Um, See, in verse 15, it is no great thing if his ministers also are transformed as the ministers of righteousness. 
They're good. They're kind. They're nice. And the devil doesn't care whether a person is good and nice and kind. You see, long as their life does not count for the Lord. And then the Bible uh, says to uh, uh, also be transformed as a minister's of righteousness. So, say, that gives us a lot of insight into the work of the devil. Say, the devil does not want you to be a dope addict. Uh, the devil does not want you to be an alcoholic. Now, I'm talking to Christians. Why? Because, say, you'll never influence anybody by living that life, uh, uh, lifestyle. You see, so uh, the devil uh, doesn't want uh, somebody to necessarily do that, but he wants people to be nice and kind and righteous, but at the same time, their life will not count for the Lord. You see, uh, as long as their life does not count for uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, great illustration of this is uh, Acts chapter 5. Now, as you turn to Acts chapter 5, we read here, See, the Bible teaches that all of us are involved in intense spiritual battle. Now, what we're talking about now is the work of the devil in your life and in my life, in the life of a child of God, not the unsaved, but the saved. Now, as you turn to Acts chapter uh, 5, and uh, here we see that God wanted to deal with, with sin in the local church. Now, in Acts chapter 5, again, a very uh, familiar uh, passage in uh, uh, the Word of God. And again, here we see that principle illustrated that the devil doesn't necessarily want you to be a dope addict. He doesn't want you to commit immorality. Now, if you do that, you really mess up and get out of the will of God and cause others to get out of the will of, uh, of God. Uh, but he doesn't want you to rob a bank. See, now, a lot of times, as God's children, our mentality about the devil in our lives is that he wants me to rob a bank. No, he doesn't want you to rob a bank. Uh, if you uh, rob a bank or want to rob a bank, that's probably because of your own covetousness and so forth. Probably doesn't have anything to do even with, uh, with the devil. But you see, he would rather that you be a nice person and a good person but your life will not count for the Lord. You're not serving God, you're not doing the will of God, and you're no benefit to uh, God's kingdom. So we pick it up here in uh, Acts chapter 5 to illustrate this point. But uh, a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, they sold some possessions. Now, again, chapter divisions in the Bible are very unfortunate. Because most of the time, they, uh, they don't follow through with the theme, and sometimes we miss out on a lot of good Bible teaching. See, the previous uh, verse, uh, the previous uh, pa uh, paragraph talks about um, this, this wonderful man in the Word of God by the name of uh, Barnabas. And the Bible says, in verse 36, which is being interpreted, see the son of consolation. And I'm sure it's been pointed out that that word consolation means encouragement. Now here's a man, uh, Barnabas, who had a gift of encouragement. See, he's always encouraging people in the things of God. And evidently he is filled with the Holy Spirit of God. He loves the Lord with all of his heart. Now, it says, verse 37, Having land, he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, here's a man that did that who was absolutely filled with the Holy Spirit of God. He was in the will of God. There is a need in the church at Jerusalem at this time, uh, as we read the, the context here in the Word of God. And so he sold his land and he gave it to the church he, at the apostles' feet. They were the leaders there in the church at uh, uh, Jerusalem. Now you have two people in the church named Ananias and Sapphira. Now, now the teaching in the Word of God here is that Barnabas did not do that to bring attention to himself in any way. He did not do that extraordinary giving to have people pat him on the back and say, boy, look at what, what, what he gave 
Nothing like that. See, he was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. He, he, he was doing it for the glory of God. He was in the, the will of God in giving that money uh, to that uh, local church there at Jerusalem. Now, evidently, somehow word got around that, uh, that he gave that extraordinary gift, evidently it was a lot of money, uh, the sale of the property uh, to the church. And somehow um, people looked in a very favorable way towards Barnabas. See, you study about him throughout the book of Acts. He's always encouraging someone. He's the one that got the Apostle Paul into ministry to preach, his, uh, uh, preach up there at Antioch. See, it was Barnabas that went to where Paul lived and say, hey, Paul, come up to Antioch with me. And uh, he was a great encouragement to him. And every place you read about him, see, he's encouraging someone. See, he's a great uh, encourager. So now he had that reputation. Now you have two people, a certain man named Ananias, chapter 5, verse 1, and Sapphira, they sold a possession and kept back part of the price. Now, now of, again, they didn't have to keep anything back. They were not required to give it. They were not required to sell their property. Barnabas did that for the glory of God, to honor God and be a blessing uh, to the local church. But now, see, the Bible says they kept back part of the price. And that uh, helps us to really interpret what is being said here and uh, very uh, clearly. And his wife also being privy uh, to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, see, they did the same thing that Barnabas did as far as giving it uh, to the local church. And, Bar and Peter said, Ananias, say, and what does he say? Why? Has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost, to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now, see, what we're talking about is the work of the devil in the life of a child of God. Now, uh, Ananias and Sapphira were members in good standing at that church at uh, Jerusalem. But now, see, here is an amazing verse. Now, you talk about the work of the devil in the life of a child of God. See, and Peter said, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Now, that word filled is the exact same word as, that's used in Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. It's the exact same word. Now, we're talking about the work of the devil in the life of a child of God. See, a child of God can be filled with the Holy Spirit as Barnabas was, or they can be filled with Satan and Satan's work in their life. See, he says here, Satan filled your heart, you see, to lie to the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, Peter had supernatural revelation in uh, insight into what was going on here through uh, uh, God's uh, special insight that he gave him at this particular time. But you see, Satan filled the heart of this man. Now, can Satan fill somebody's heart today? Can Satan fill your heart today? Can Satan fill my heart today? So you're talking about the work of the devil in the life of a child of God. See, a child of God can be filled with the Spirit or they can be filled with the devil. They can be filled with Satan. So he says, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? See, that's the second time that's mentioned. And obviously, I'm sure everybody here tonight knows what, what is going on here is that they said they had given all of the money of the pro, uh, pro, uh, proceeds of that land sa uh, sale to the church. Now, see, and they lied. 
They didn't give all my... Now, they didn't have to give anything to begin with. This was a voluntary thing. See, Barnabas did what he did in a voluntary way. They, they weren't coerced to do it or anything like that. Um, they weren't told to do it. But you see, now, what they did is that, see, uh, they gave that money, but, you see, it was under a lie. They lied to God. See, because they said they gave all of the proceeds of that property, all the money that they made off the sale of that property to the church at Jerusalem. Now, see, and Peter had insight, discernment, supernatural insight, discernment into it, and he knew that they were lying. And he knew why they were lying. Because he said they're filled with the devil. They were filled with Satan. Can a Christian be filled with Satan? Absolutely. That's what the Bible says here. You can't get around it. And you see in verse 4, it says, while it remained, uh, was it not thine own? See, it was your money. You, you didn't have to give it to the church. Nobody told you to give it to the church. Nobody told you to sell that, that property and give it to the church. And um, so he says, uh, and after it was sold, was it not thine own power? See, that was your money. You had no, uh, nobody told you to give it to the church. You had no uh, mandate to give it to the church at all. There's a, nothing like that at all. See, the, it was all uh, free will uh, giving. Uh, like Barnabas did. And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, say, but unto God. And then we find that both of them were struck dead by the Lord. And Ananias was struck dead and his wife was struck dead uh, by the Lord. Now, a great insight there and a great message for all of us today you know, about being controlled by the devil, uh, by, being li uh, by lying to God. See, and you see that God hates that. See, God is not pleased with that type of a thing, uh, very uh, obviously. But now, you see, the reason behind all of this trouble was Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and lie to God. And, of course, they lied to the church. See, they said, well, we gave everything, all the money we made from that property. And um, that they lied. And Peter knew that they lied. Uh, they lied to God. They lied to the Holy Spirit. Great teaching there about the Holy Spirit. But what was their sin? What was the sin that, that God... Um, dealt so drastically with. Their basic sin was what? See, now they lied. There's no question about that. And they, they lied. And Peter said, see, you didn't only lie to the church. See, you, that lie was before God. You told that lie and you lied to God. But their basic sin was what? What, what did they, why did they do what they did? Pride. To what? Pride. Okay, pride. Uh, right, there's no question about that. Uh, that was a sin of pride. Why? See, they wanted everybody to think that they evidently were as spiritual as Barnabas. Now, keep in mind... Barnabas is a humble guy. He's just doing what he did for the glory of God. He didn't want any praise brought, brought to him. But now you see, these people are filled with pride. There's no question about that. See, they wanted people to pat them on the back and say, oh, what a great Christian you are. Now, you see what we're talking about? How Satan works in the life of a child of God, saved people, not unsaved, but uh, uh, saved people. Now, what might be another uh, uh, sin that we um, see here in the Word of God? Now, pride is certainly very evidenced here in relation to this sin. 
But what might be another thing that characterized Ananias and Sapphira and the sin that they uh, committed that was so serious in the sight of God that the Lord uh, judged them in this severe way? See, I believe we have uh, probably two things here in the Word of God, but what might be another thing that we have here uh, in the Word of God? You see, one is definitely pride, and the other obviously is covetousness. See, they kept part of that. You can imagine them, uh, they're thinking about this, they have it all planned, and they said, now, you know, we're, uh, we're, these are Christian people, we're, we're going to lie, we're going to tell a lie, we're going to, you know, because we want this praise brought to us. See, uh, we're, uh, we want glory brought to us, and so that, that's pride. And so their, their thought is, well, let's keep back some of it for ourselves. That's too much to give to the church, and we'll just keep a good, nice portion for a rainy day or something like that, whatever, I, you, you don't know uh, what they were thinking. But you see, it was not only a matter of pride, it was a matter of covetousness. See, uh, they desired uh, to keep some for themselves. Now, keep in mind, they, they could have done that, and that wouldn't have been a sin against God. But you see, to lie about the matter, see, the lying, See, they lied to God. They lied to the church. They lied to uh, uh, the Holy Spirit. So I think we have lying, we have covetousness, and we have pride. That's like someone going around saying, I am a faithful tither. I tithe my income. I want everybody to know I'm a tither. And they really don't tithe. See, they're like Ananias and Sapphira. See, they're telling a lie. See, they're keeping back part of that tithe for themselves. They're not tithing, they're tipping God. Not tithing, but tipping. But anyway, uh, you, you see how um, that could be very common today. Someone in the church, and they brag that I am a tither, when really they're not a tither, or they brag, oh, I give so much money to the church. I, I give more than anybody else uh, uh, to the church. See, and all of that is of the, the devil, obviously, as you read uh, the Word of God. So, um, you see, that's the sin that we see here. Now, the point we're getting, that's how the devil goeth about as a roaring lion. He didn't cause these people to get drunk. He didn't cause them to commit immorality. What he's, uh, well, the way the devil worked in their life was causing them to be proud and covetous. See, and that's the way the devil works. See, and we all know that the original sin of the devil was a matter of uh, pride. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6. Now, what we're dealing with, and Lord willing, we might uh, pick it up if the Lord wills uh, next Wednesday night, but you see, the work of the devil in the life of a child of God. See, and you see it there in Acts chapter 5. But now in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6. Now, this is talking about the spiritual qualifications for a pastor. That's the context here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse uh, 6. Now, the Bible says, not a novice. Now, that's talking about someone who's inexperienced in the things of God. It's not only talking about a new convert, but somebody who has never really proven themselves. You see, they are a novice in the things of God. Now, in verse 6 it says, lest be being lifted up with pride. You see the point there? See what we're getting at? See, that's pride. That, that can lead to pride. 
when someone is exalted or put in a position that they shouldn't be put in, whatever, and they're a new convert or a weak Christian or a Christian that has not uh, been proven, as a result of that, they can be given over to the matter, as it says here in verse 6, lifted up with pride, he fall into, and the Bible says here, the condemnation of the devil. See, and that was the sin, and I believe the proper exegesis of that verse is that that was the sin that condemned Lucifer. That's the sin that made the devil the devil. That's the sin that made Satan, Satan. See, uh, Isaiah 14 and many uh, verses in the Bible. But you see what we're getting at there uh, in the Word of God. See, that's a terrible sin. See, that's a sin of pride. And you see, pride is associated with the devil. See, uh, very clear in the Word of God. Ananias and Sapphira, they're proud. They're egotistical. They want attention brought to themselves. Now, see, and here it's talking here literally about a pastor. See, someone who's a novice and experienced that type of thing. And um, see, uh, because the Bible says, lest he fall uh, or being lifted up, see, with pride, he falls into the same condemnation and the same sin that caused Lucifer to fall. That original sin was not found in the Garden of Eden. That original sin was found before the world was created when Lucifer became Satan and through pride. Say, I will, I will. Those I wills there over and over again in Isaiah 14. I will, I will, I will. And, uh, but you see, what we're talking about is the work of the devil in the life of a child of God. Always remember Satan's ministers are ministers of righteousness. The devil himself is an angel of light. You see, and we see in the Word of God how he goeth about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And that doesn't mean, again, that he wants us to uh, live like the devil, so to speak, but it means that he wants us to be nice and kind and uh, uh, so forth, but at the same time, be full of covetousness and full of pride. And when a person is full of covetousness and pride, the devil has them right where he wants them to be because they'll never be a testimony for the Lord. They'll never serve God. They'll never do uh, the will of God. Well, I trust that God will speak to our hearts, but our homework will be check out the verses in the epistles now that are found in the epistles that speak of the work of the devil in the life of a child of God. You see, all those verses in the epistles are primarily in relation to Satan and the devil are dealing with the child of God, someone who is saved, not talking about the unsaved, but uh, study your Bible and uh, read the Word of God and let's come back Wednesday, uh, next Wednesday night and see according to the Word of God, how the devil works in the life of a saved person, how he's working in your life, how he wants to work in my life. Now, the redeeming thing, the positive thing, is James 4, 7. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Say, we must, as God's children, resist him, take our stand against him. Uh, we must be sober. We must be vigilant. On, uh, and if we're not, the devil will have us exactly where he wants us to be.